Hello, Victory Church. It's great to be with you again. I really appreciate this opportunity just to minister the Word, and we're going to be jumping into Isaiah 6 verse 8 as we do a two-part series looking at Rise and Build, and the series is called Available, because we've got to awaken before we can arise. We've got to be available before we can go and start to build. And so as we press into 2021, we're going to be looking at what does it mean to be available for God and to the purposes of God in our city and in our generation. And I believe this is incredibly significant because of the magnitude of everything we're dealing with, both in our personal worlds and the world at large. With all that's going on, how much more does the kingdom of God need a people who are available to move with the Spirit? And Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So he's looking for those that are available to be active as in seeing the kingdom advanced. But what does that mean? What does it mean to be used by God? And how do I get myself ready for that? You know, Jake Hayford is a leader that I greatly respect. And I saw an interview with his daughter once. And she was asked this simple question. What do you think the world would have looked like today if Jack Hayford would have never existed? So if Jack Hayford would have never done all that he's done, what do you think the world would look like? And her answer blew my mind. She said nothing would change. She said the same number of people would give their lives to Jesus. The same number of people would have a call of God on their life and would move in response and do great things for the king and his kingdom. And then she said something that really impacted me and prompted what I'm wanting to share on today and in the series about being available. She said, Jack just said yes. And if he wouldn't have said yes, God would have found someone else who was saying, here I am send me because God knows the beginning from the end. He's the Alpha and Omega and he is committed to outworking his will and his purposes on earth according to his good pleasure but he loves to use us and for us to partner with him and Jack had this approach. He had the approach to say yes to whatever the Lord would ask him to do and so I want to give you the foundational verse that we're going to be unpacking over these next two weeks. It's Isaiah 6 verse 8 and if you can turn there in your Bibles or look on the screen I'm sure that'll pop up. And it says this, Isaiah 6 verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, and it's these next few words, actually five words that are going to summarize the entire series. And today we're going to focus on the first three. And I said, here I am. Here I am. Won't you turn to your neighbor and say, where are you at? Where are you at? And then the last two words are, send me. So God asks, who's going to go for us? And it's almost as if Isaiah is waving his hands in the air. God's attention is on him. His gaze is on him. And Isaiah is like, here I am. Send me. I'll go. I don't even know where you're asking me to go yet. But the answer is yes. Now, what's the question? And I want to unpack this. Because my first temptation is to jump straight into preaching a sermon on send me. You know, I'm ready, I'm, I'm energized, I'm full of faith, send me. And if I think we were to, if I was to sit with any of you, you would say, yes, I want to be used this year in 2021. I want to be activated. I want to go for it. I want to rise. I want to build. Send me. But there's something dynamic that happens in this verse before Isaiah says, send me. Before he says that, he says, here I am. And so today I want to talk with you on the subject of here I am. This is where I'm at. So let me just pray. Father, we thank you for your presence today. We thank you for your being with us. We pray that you will open our hearts, open our minds, take away our preconceived ideas and notions. And we say, here we are, our Lord. We make ourselves available. Convict us, challenge us, encourage us, do whatever you need to do in us. That as we dive into your uh, truth, that sets us free to pursue you wholeheartedly. So the angel of the Lord comes to Isaiah and he says these words, who will go for us? And these five words that we see are actually one Hebrew word, which is the word yalach. And it means to move, to lead, to proceed, and to go. Let me read that again. It means move, lead, proceed, and go. So who's going to move? Who's going to make a move? Who's going to be willing to make a move this year? You see, I believe there's a go for each of us in the kingdom. I believe that if you're still breathing, God's not done with you yet. And if you're still breathing, God has a go for you. Maybe it's at your cubicle at work. 
Maybe it's meeting someone in the grocery store. Maybe it's online on, online on a Zoom session. I don't know what your goal is. It could be starting an NGO or going back to college and studying. I don't know what it is, but I believe that God has a go for you. And the ultimate response for us is to say, yes, I'm available. And so next week, we're going to look at what it means to say, send me. But ultimately, we want to say, yes, I'm available. And here's the thing. Before we can ever utter the word, send us, we must be able to do an analysis and an assessment of where am I at? This is where I'm at. And sometimes I wonder if God waits to tell us our go because he's waiting for us to figure out where we're at. And maybe where we're at makes us ineligible for where we're supposed to go. And so God wants to deal with us first before he ever wants to do something to us in the natural. He always wants to do something inside of us to work his grace in us so he can outwork his grace through us. Let me ask a question about where you're at in the middle of, as I say that word, in this COVID moment. If you like me, you're desperate to get out the house. Any excuse to get out of lockdown and get moving and get out of, in a sense, being isolated. And you might be in that place where, as with me, if Leanne's baking something and she says, I'm out of sugar, I'm like, here I am, send me, I'm your man, I'm going, I'm in the car, I'm ready for this adventure. But think of it this way as we're describing this. If Leanne is baking something and she says, I need some sugar, and my teenage daughter, Amber, who doesn't have her license yet, says, here I am, send me, I'll take your car, you know, I'd say, forget about it. Sorry, that's my best Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation. I'd say, forget about it. You're not driving my car anywhere. Because she needs to assess where she's at before she can actually go and engage with what she's wanting to do. She's not ready to go. And she's not ready to be sent yet. And I wonder if there's something that God wants to do in us. You know, many times at the start of the year, year after year, we come to God and we say, God, I want you to use me. I want you to send me. Um, I'm begging you, Lord, what's my purpose? What's my goal? What do you want to do with me on this earth? And God's like, I want to do something in your heart before you do something on this earth. Let me read that again. I want to do something in your heart before you do something in this earth. And next week, we're going to have some fun looking at what it means to say, send me. But today, I want us to take a moment just to examine ourselves and say, God, is there something you want to do in me before you do something through me? And we're going to look at three simple questions that we must ask ourselves as we live, as we lead, and as we lean into 2021. And the first question we're going to ask ourselves is, where am I? Where am I? Take a moment, look at the person sitting and watching next to you, and say with a little bit of attitude, where are you at? Where are you at? Uh, I can't show you, but I thought I pulled it off quite well. The point is this. It's not a geographical question. I'm not asking you if you're watching from Durban, or if you're watching in your living room, or if you're watching in the kitchen, or if you're watching while you're in the bathroom. I know that's a little bit awkward. It's a little bit awkward for all of us. But I'm not asking where you are geographically. I'm saying, what is the condition of your heart? That's what I believe God's saying here. Where are you at? What are you struggling with right now? In the midst of this moment in COVID, what are you fighting over? What are you tormented with? What are you mad about? Where are you at? And I love this phrase, here I am. It's this idea where we speak about send me. Send me is, it only occurs this one time throughout Scripture when you look at it in this sense as the word send me uttered. But it's not, the, it's not the same when we look at the phrase, here I am. It's the Hebrew word, hineni, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. But this phrase is repeated numerous times throughout Scripture. We see people and men and women of faith saying, here I am. We see it with Abraham where he says, here I am, twice in the book of Genesis in chapter 22. And Jacob says it twice again in Genesis in chapter 31 and 46. Do you remember Moses at the burning bush when the bush, God calls out to him from the burning bush and he responds, here I am. That was his response. Do you remember Samuel with Eli when he's hearing this voice calling his name and he goes to Eli and Eli says, no, go to sleep, it's not me. No, go to sleep, it's not me. And eventually he says, it's the Lord. The next time you hear that call, say, here I am, Lord, speak. And so there's this idea that we need to utter these words as we see even Isaiah doing here. 
And maybe you remember in the New Testament with Ananias when Saul comes to him blinded and the Lord speaks to Ananias about how to handle the situation. And Ananias responds, here I am, Lord. See, here's the thing. Before the assignment comes, there's always the moment of having to say, here I am. Before the assignment comes, there's this moment where we need to say, here I am. And many of us are waiting for an assignment, but I think something far more important is that we get to that place where we utter, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm at, Lord. Maybe I'm not where I I need to be, and Lord, I need you to help me become what I'm supposed to become so that I can be all that you've called me to be. This is where I'm at. Now, remember what happened with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 verse 8. It says, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees in the garden. Now watch what God asks. And he says, But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Now that wasn't a geographical question. He knew where Adam was. He didn't say, Which tree are you hiding behind? The apple tree, the lemon tree? No. He's like, Adam, where are you at, man? Now I want you to watch Adam's reply. Adam doesn't reply and say, I'm behind the third tree on the left. No, this is what he says. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. And we know he was naked and hiding. And he says, I was afraid. He's saying, this is where I'm at. I'm afraid. This is where I am at, God. I'm fearful. So I hid. I didn't know what else to do. And this is the idea of where you're at, of discovering, doing a self-analysis, examining your own heart in this moment to realize what's going on. You see, God is wanting us to come this morning and to be able to answer this question faithfully, wholeheartedly, as he asks us, where are you? And uh, we have to have courage to do this, to actually open up our hearts and say, Lord, look at the deep things. Search them out with me. To be able to say, I'm freaked out, God. I'm worried. You know, I'm anxious. I have unforgiveness in my heart. And because of that, I'm harboring bitterness. And I'm holding that against someone. And I'm feeling rejected. I'm feeling that there's some shame in areas because of all these things. Really, it's this idea of Adam saying, you know what? Lord, this is the reality of where I'm in in my sin, in my shame, in my brokenness, in my confusion, in my despair. Lord, this is where I'm at. And the Lord loves it when we do that because then he can minister healing and wholeness and bring freedom to us right where we're at. But we've got to have the courage to admit where we are, not geographically, but in terms of our heart and the posturing of our hearts. And I'm convinced that God is far more interested in this than he is with our circumstance or in getting you where you want to be. He's far more interested in getting our hearts where he desires them to be. And so here's a principle. God will always seek to deal with your spirituality before he deals with your physicality. We often think from the natural, but he's dealing with us in the spiritual, in every area, but he's going after the deep parts of us. And before he gives you a call, before he gives you your next assignment, he wants you to make sure your heart is ready for that assignment. And it involves this idea of saying, Lord, here I am. Why? Because God is more interested in the eternal than he is in the temporary. He's more interested in your eternal purpose than he is in your circumstantial predicament in which you possibly find yourself right now. He wants to work in that, but it's from the inside out. And so he wants to deal with us at a heart level, at a level that's going to have eternal fruit and bearing. So here's another principle. We want to know if God is available for our circumstantial breakthrough. We get obsessed with that. And God wants to know this. Are you available for his spiritual breakthrough? Is he able to trust you with that? Is that something you're pursuing and desiring to see in your life? And some of you might have entered this year fasting and Often our approach, and I believe it's biblical and I've done it and and we need to apply it, but often our approach is, God, I need you to do this for me. I need breakthrough in my life, so I need you to do this on my behalf in this circumstance. But I want to challenge you to also do this. When you fast, if that's what you're doing and praying in the season, say, God, if there's something in me that needs breakthrough, show me. Because your physical breakthrough might be coming hot on the heels of your spiritual breakthrough. And God God is holding that breakthrough sometimes in your life and mine, not because he's withholding it. He's holding it for us because he has a much larger breakthrough that he wants to do in your heart to prepare you for the breakthrough that's to come. He doesn't want the breakthrough to break you. 
Do you understand what I'm saying? He wants your heart and he wants your whole heart and he wants you to be living in wholeness as he engages you in your purpose. So to answer the first question, where am I? Here I am. We need to respond. We need to be able to answer that. And here's the second one. Question number two. The first one is here I am. The second one is this. How am I? How am I doing? How am I doing in this thing called life? How am I feeling? How am I doing at getting through this that I'm going through? And the reason I think this is so important is because this is one of the places where I believe we uh, get deceived the most. You know, we're really good at telling other people where they're at, but we're really, really bad at being honest with ourselves with where we're at. And I came across this quote that I thought gets the point across really well. Please excuse the grammar. It says, It ain't what you know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. Let me read that again. It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so. I've got an American wife, and sometimes where I'm not sharp and I'm not getting it, Leanne might uh, revert to that sort of American twang, and uh, she helps me to understand what she's saying. But uh, it's the things that we know that aren't true, that we deceived in. They're just not so. It's those things that are getting us into trouble. It's those things that are tripping us up. And so here's the, the thing I want to get across. The devil is a deceiver. And here's the reality we need to face. There is none so deceived as the deceived. You see, here's the thing. You don't know when you're deceived. That's the very definition of what that word means. And we think, well, it's not me. I'm not deceived. But how do you know unless you've got the Holy Spirit, unless you've got people around you, unless you're being honest with yourself? And so we've got to analyze and examine our hearts to see if we're in faith or if we're in fear or in doubt or placing our faith in things that cannot bring us through because there's no reality and no substance to them. And uh, some of these idols we carry are easy to recognize. Things like, as I've mentioned, unforgiveness or shame or rejection or bitterness. Those can become idols in our life. And God wants to deal with our heart and some of the areas that he loves ministering to is our identity. He loves to bring security where we have insecurities. He loves to affirm us where we're needing validation. And we, we need to be our finding our identity in him. And those are quite easy to, to pick out and navigate. But there are some other ones that are hard to deal with, where there's a real deception. And it's this area of idols. And I want us to see where idols can creep into our lives. Maybe they have leading up until 2021. And I want us to be free of those things so that we can run freely with what God has for us. So I want to take a moment to address this topic of idols and how deceiving they are. And here's the thing. All throughout Scripture, idols are presented as these things that are carved. And you might think, well, you know, I don't whittle. I don't carve. I don't have an idol I bow down to. Leviticus 26 says it like this. You shall not make idols for yourselves or erect an image or a pillar. And you shall not set up or carve out figured stone in your land to bow down to. For I am the Lord your God. And we're like, well, Lord, I'm not doing any of those things. But I want to paint a different picture. Because sometimes idols are things that we figuratively engage with that we're not even aware that it's happening. As I mentioned, they're the big ones that might be like addiction or alcoholism or lust or any of those areas. But there's some sneaky idols that creep into our lives that we need to make sure that we're coming free of, that the Lord wants to free us of so that we can run freely into his purpose. And so let me read to you two quotes on idols that really um, spoke to me. The one is by a man named Steve Cuss, and he's written a great book on leadership called Managing Leadership Anxiety. Very very practical for the times we're in. But he said this, you know something is an idol when you sacrifice time, power, or resources in order to get it. Let me read that again. You know something is an idol when you sacrifice time, power, or resources in order to get it. Tim Keller, who writes extensively on this topic, says it this way, an idol is something other than Jesus that we need in order to feel happy or complete. Anything that you need on a daily basis to make you feel happy or complete other than Jesus, it's an idol. And I don't necessarily believe there's anything wrong with having a glass of wine at night, but if you need it to be happy, 
Well, then we need to look at that. If we're thinking, well, I've had a long day, I just have to, I just need to have a glass of wine. Guess what? That might be an idol. And maybe that's not a temptation for you. But maybe you've got to do something else, or you need to have something else, or you have to say something else, or you need to post something else. That can become an idol. And so here's some examples of sneaky idols that we need to look at and deal with. Here's some things that are maybe things that are making us feel happy that are other than Jesus. Okay? Now, brace yourself. Number one, the need to be heard. When you need to be heard and you're not being, so you've got to raise your voice and get louder, your desire and craving to be heard has become an idol. Why? Because you need it. And now I'm going to step on some toes because I don't want to just pick on you. So let me pick on myself. As pastors, often acceptance becomes an idol. It's this need to be accepted. And it becomes an idol in our lives. And I'm being vulnerable with you. You know, pastors want to be liked by everyone. Steve Jobs would say we'd want to sell ice cream. If you know that statement, if you want to, if you want to be liked, don't lead, sell ice cream. And pastors, we want to be liked. We struggle with this thing. You know, we feel, you know, I've got to please everyone. I've got to be everything to everybody. And we have difficulty not accepting meetings with people that want to connect with us. Even when we don't have time, we just don't know how to say no. Because we don't want them to think we're a bad person or a bad leader or a terrible pastor. And if you're doing that, if you're held by that, and I'm speaking to myself in this regard as well, that can become an idol. Why? Because you need to be in control. And you need to control the situation to be in control of what other people think about you in order for you to feel happy. That's an idol. So here's another one. The need to be right all the time. You see a post and you just have to respond, right? Well, that can be an idol. Let's keep going. The need to be understood. You always have to have the last word. It's an idol. They never understood what I said, so I'm going to repeat it. I have to have the last thing to be said on this topic. Anything that you need that can, you can actually get from Jesus, but you choose to get from others to make you happy or feel complete is an idol. The need to be important. This is that person when you're taking them out and you're having a pizza with them and you're talking about pizza topics and in the next breath they're talking about people they know and name dropping. And you're thinking, how did we even get there? We were talking about pizza. You see, it's this insecurity. It's this feeling that I have to feel needed. I'll do whatever it takes to feel the void that I fill in my heart. The need to be noticed is another one that we need to deal with. The need to be liked, where you'll do whatever it takes to be liked by everyone else. Whatever the peers are doing to fit in with that group. And young people really struggle in this area because there's a need to be accepted rather than knowing and finding security that they're accepted just in the beloved. And these are sneaky and they trap all of us. And Tim Keller, when writing about idols, he calls idols a dysfunctional savior. If there are these things in your life, I want to say they are dysfunctional saviors. And he goes on to define it like this. He says, anything that we pursue other than Jesus to satisfy our desires and our needs is a dysfunctional savior. And idols are one of the most deceptive things that the enemy will use against you. It's something that comes to enslave your heart. It comes to limit you, to bind you, to hold you in bondage, to enslave your heart. And if your heart is enslaved to idols, you are limited in your capacity to be used by God to the magnitude that He truly wants to use you. Because He knows that if He increases your influence and your, your platform and your reach and your success, that idol will become bigger and its hold on your life will become bigger. It's like plugging an electric guitar into an amplifier. It's going to make that, it's going to amplify the sound. It's like if you have a spat with your fiance before you get married and think, well, I'll just get married and, I'll make every, and it'll make everything better. No, the marriage counselors will tell you it will only amplify that. And so God wants to free our hearts first to ready us for the more that he has for us and desires to do in us and through us. So what are idols? I encourage you and I challenge you to pursue this. Let me show you a passage of scripture. And I don't have time to break it down, so this is an assignment and homework for you for the week. I want you to read Isaiah 44, verse 6 to verse 20. And here's what's happening as you unpack this verse. It's this picture of a carpenter that's carrying an idol. But at the same time, even as he's, sorry, carving an idol. 
But even as he's carving this idol, the same wood that he's using for the carving, he's also using to make a fire from. And the same material that he builds the fire with and the idol, he uses to fuel this fire to warm himself so that he can cook a meal over it as well. And so he cooks his meal over it. He finds warmth in it. He's carved an idol that gives him comfort out of it as well. All out of the same material. Comfort, nourishment, communion with this idol. And he's talking about these people who do such things. He says they, referring to them as being like the carpenter, they understand nothing and their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. What does that mean? It means they're deceived. They don't know what they're doing. Here's what he's pointing out. Verse 19, no one stops to think. Other versions will say no one stops to reflect, to discern, to consider their own heart. And isn't that really the key, even as we look through what we've been speaking about here today? Can we just stop? Can we just reflect? Can we just discern with the Spirit of God? Can we just consider the condition of our hearts? Where am I at? How am I? Take time to think about these things. And it goes on to say this, no one has the knowledge or the understanding to say. Say so no, one, no one's grasping this. No one has the knowledge or the understanding to say, half of it I use for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I make a detestable thing from that which is left? Shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? So even as we read this, like the carpenter in the story, God gives us talents and he gives us gifts and he desires for us to use them. But what we often land up doing is crafting things out of them from which we get our identity. Let me give you an explanation of that with myself. Maybe God gives me a, a gift to preach, but it's not me. It's, it's a gift from him. But if I'm not careful, I'll find my identity in it, and then it becomes an idol, right? So this is what it's saying then. We turn around and we worship the thing that he created, forgetting the source from which it came, seeking comfort and acceptance from the gift rather than the gift giver. And I want to challenge you with that. What are you good at? What are you gifted at? What have you found your identity in? Is it in the one who gave you the gift or is it in the gift itself? So let's play it out and look at myself, for instance. If I've got an a idol of needing acceptance, I can start to find warmth and comfort in that thing. I crave acceptance. And so when someone is impressed by me, I find comfort in that. I think, oh, that feels good. It feels great when someone says, good sermon. And then I start to not only find comfort in that, I start to cook meals over it, and I start to nourish myself in it, the product of this idol. And I think, you know, I'm such a good speaker. I'm such a, a big deal. And guess what? I've entered into idol worship. Did you know that you can actually be using a gift that God has given you and actually be deceived by that very gift? You're actually playing for the wrong team with God's gift. Verse 20 says this, such a person feeds on ashes. You think it's nourishing you, but you're actually being, finding yourself in a place of malnutrition. So I want to ask you, where are you at? You know, I could have preached a message at the beginning of the year start of 2021, it's going to be the blessed year of your life. But that would have just brought ear-tickling comfort rather than spine-stiffening courage. And it wouldn't be loving you. I believe in 2021, as we arise and build, we need to move beyond just bless me to Lord, here I am, send me. We're not called to just chase blessing, but to pursue and seek the purpose of the blessed one. And I'm saying send me I want to be used. Here I am. I want to make myself available. I want to be part of your men and women who are advancing, pioneers advancing the kingdom. And God wants to ask us today, where are you at? How are you doing? We need to take a look at our hearts. And then thirdly, the most important point is this. How will I? How will I? You might think, I agree with all that's being said, but how will I live this out? How will I overcome? I want to give just three quick steps. Step number one, ask the Holy Spirit about you. Don't ask the Holy Spirit about what you are wanting or what you're wanting Him to do. 
You can do that as well. But in this step, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit about you. And he'll tell you, he'll guide you, he'll comfort you, he'll counsel you, he'll establish you, he'll show you what you need to work on and where you need to apply God's grace so that you can live in the truth of who he's called you to be. John 6 verse 7 says this, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict. And it's this thing of conviction where he's going to cause us, and it continues to say, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Here it is, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. He says, I'm going to bring conviction so that people will come out of unbelief into faith. That's what he wants to do with us. He says, I'm going to bring conviction concerning righteousness because I've gone to the Father on their behalf and I want them to know that they are established in my righteousness and able to stand in me perfectly before the Father. And I want to go because I want to bring conviction concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. That means the enemy has been defeated and we don't have to live under his dominion. So if you ask the Holy Spirit, he will talk to you about you. And he will lead you into understanding the fullness of your identity. He ministers grace to where you are so that you can live uh, in the fullness of where he wants you to display his glory. God wants your heart free and he wants your affection to flourish. The enemy wants your marriage, your finance, your family, your identity, and your heart to be enslaved. So pray for the Holy Spirit to break through in your circumstances. Do that, but also... Pray for the Holy Spirit to break through in you. The second thing is this. Ask you about you. Do you know who the easiest person to deceive on the planet is? It's everybody else. The hardest person is yourself. It's hard to be honest with yourself. Galatians uh, 5 verse 4 says, Let everyone be devoted to fulfill the work God has given them to do with excellence and their joy will be in doing what's right and being themselves and not in being affirmed by others. Every believer is ultimately responsible for his or her own conscience. I better ask myself about myself because I'm responsible for me. Romans 14 verse 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. It's not your job to give an account for politicians or government or Facebook friends or WhatsApp posts or your spouse. Your job is to give an account for yourself. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5, examine yourself. And last but not least is number three. After you ask the Holy Spirit about you, ask yourself about yourself. Then you need to ask others about you. If you don't know your own weakness, you know who does? Everyone else. You need to have an honest conversation with friends and trusted mentors and voices in your life. Because Proverbs 24 verse 6 says, For by wise guidance you can wage your war, and in the abundance of counselors there is victory. It's saying that as we get input, godly input into our lives, it arms us for that which we're going to face, and it prepares us to take victory in the circumstances we we facing. So I want to encourage you, ask someone, ask a trusted friend, ask a godly mentor, ask them what are some of the weaknesses that they see in you. I need to ask them what they see in me. We need to have those people that say, George, that's not the right way to talk. That's not the right way to think. That's not the right way to act. It's not who you are. And these people, you give them permission to speak into your life, not to call you out for the things you've done wrong, but to call you up into your God-ordained destiny identity. And so we need to give permission to these people. So here's the good news about what I want to share today. Where you currently are does not determine where you can ultimately go. Where you currently are does not determine where you can ultimately go. I believe that God wants to use you for more, for greater, and bigger things for his kingdom. But if you're not there yet, it just means there's something else that God's still wanting to work in you to prepare you for that which he has for you. So I want to encourage you, make yourself available for that, just as you are. You don't have to wait and get all polished up. You can say, God, I'm available. This is where I'm at. God, use me. And it might be even to open up and say, Lord, this is the amount of resource I have, time I have, wisdom I have, skill set I have. Use it for your kingdom. This is the influence I've got. 
Make me effective where I am and where I'm at. And that's how we invite God's response. I just love this. Because when you look in Scripture, not only do we say, here I am, but in Scripture you see God saying, here I am. And it's this Hebrew word, hineni. And it expresses total readiness to give oneself. It's an offer of total availability, emphasizing I'm present and I'm ready for action. Not only are we available to God, but He is available to us. Not only are we saying, yeah, Lord, I'm ready to move into action, send me, but He's saying, I'm ready to act on your behalf. And God says this of Himself throughout Scripture. When He's announcing what He is uh, going to be doing, it, ap- it appears many times, especially in the prophetic uh, writings where it uses this phrase, behold, I will. And when you look at that, it is even more accurately translated, behold, here I am doing this thing. And that's what God wants to say to you and to me. So we can know this, that God is our ever-present help. As David reminds us in Psalm 46, and as ridiculous as it might seem, God actually makes himself, as I've said, available to us and has shown that he is ready to pay the highest cost even in the life of his son, which he gave freely and out of love. The great I am stoops to assure us. He hears us. He sees us. He knows our struggle, and he is always there. He is mighty. He is our rescuer. He is the awesome warrior by our side. And some versions actually say dreaded warrior because the enemy dreads when he pitches up. And so when we respond and say, here I am, Haneni, I'm available, I'm totally available, we are saying, this is where I am, This is how I am, and how will I? And he responds to that. God responds, and he declares, Behold, here I am. I'm doing this thing. So I just want to encourage you with that, even as we just um, starting this year and saying, Lord, I want to arise and build into the purpose and future you have for me. And we in this moment of speaking about what it means to be available, and next week we're going to follow on and saying, What does it mean to be sent? So let me pray. Lord, we just, as a community, say, Here we are. We open up our hearts. We thank you, Lord, that we can say this is where we're at. This is how we are. And Lord, how do we go forward? And we can journey that with you as a community. Thank you that you have given us um, just a, a wonderful team, leaders and Louis and Edna, friends around the globe, that we might be encouraged in this together. I thank you, Lord, that as we continue just to lead into this you, I speak your blessing, your protection, your health over every family member, every household. And we just thank you, Lord, that even as we are those that don't chase your blessing, we pursue you, but you pour out your blessing, your favor and grace upon us. I pray that in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen.